Welcome. Uh, so one, let me just say a, a, a few things. I'm grateful. One, for waking up this morning. And two, that you decided to uh, come fellowship with us on a Sunday, a beautiful Sunday, I might add. Uh, and you could have chosen to, to do a zillion other things, but you chose to come out uh, and spend some time here. So I'm, I'm grateful. So thank you uh, for having me coming. Um, I want to do a shout out for somebody, a um, good friend of mine who's been friends with 20 years. I don't know, 20 years. It's her birthday. <laughs> Laura Dull, Dr. Laura Dull, it's her birthday today. Happy birthday, Laura. 61 years young. 61 years young. Happy birthday, Laura. 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 That's what I'm talking about. Um, and so um, everybody is, is, is gathered here today to come out and, and just check out our work. Um, I titled it in evolution for a number of reasons. One, uh, because I'm, I'm a complex person. Like, right, people try to put me in a box and you can never put me in a box, like, ever. Um, and so, evolution really is about my work from the beginnings of who Michelle was as a closeted black woman living in this country to the person that I am now um, who is not a, really afraid of closets, but I kind of busted out of closets and will never go back into a closet when it comes to my identity as a black queer woman in this country. Um, it was something that I used to be uh, ashamed of. It was something that I hid. And so as my work has evolved, my voice as a person, as a black woman in this country has evolved as well. Um, it has made me more uh, confident in who I am. And while I want people to, um, to like and appreciate my work, it's not something that um, I necessarily have to have. I'm not saying I want y'all to buy stuff. I do want y'all to buy stuff. <laughs> um, but it's not something that drives me, right? So um, what drives me is my passion for getting it out. My work keeps me sane. I use it to sublimate uh, stress and anxiety. So I try to do something every day uh, whether it's a sketch or whether it's painting something or whether it's writing some poetry to kind of get out and release and try to get myself into a flow. Um, so what you see out here, and I'll start in this room and, and tell you a little bit about the Stolen Lives Project and then uh, talk a little bit about some work that's out there. But So the Stolen Lives Project was born about six years ago when the bathroom debates um, were coming about, about transgender, gender non-expanse of people uh, in this country, and everyone lumping th this community, an already marginalized, an already oppressed and vulnerable community into this box. And so I started uh, the project really just to raise awareness and to highlight the epi epidemic proportions of homicides that are impacting this com community. And specifically, when you look, dig deep into this data, specifically impacts black transgender women, right? So when I say a black transgender woman, I'm referring to a person that was born male and has transitioned to, um, to female or is living their life as female. And so the epidemic proportions of murders and violent um, consequences that these people have to endure is what um, prompted me to begin this work. And so um, if you look back in that back corner, the left, left blue, the, the blue, that bold blue, that's Zella Ziona. Um, Zella was, she was walking down the street, she ran across some folks that she knew from, from middle school, people that she had known for, for some time. But she was living her life as Zella, and not who had known her previously. And so she knew these folks for some time. And she said something to one of the guys, because she is, again, she's known them since middle school. What happened as a result of that joke, just a simple joke, led to her murder, led to her homicide. And, and, it's, and as you go across uh, the room, you will, you will hear a little bit about each of these people and the tragic endings of their lives just for existing, just for trying to live um, as an out, trans, or gender expansive person. And so while this work is heavy, it's near and dear to my heart because more people need to, uh, to do something. I have a term on the board uh, as the definition of ally, right? So an ally is a person that kind of gets in that struggle, you're an advocate, you're affirming people, you're doing all of that. But we need folks to move beyond being allies. Uh, Bettina Love tells this story, Dr. Bettina Love, and we need 
Let me correct it. <laughs> Dr. Fatima Love tells the story of a difference between allies and co-conspirators. You know, we need co-conspirators. We need co-conspirators. And so a co-conspirator is someone that is not afraid to take a risk. She tells the story of uh, Bree Newsom and James Tyson. Bree Newsom is the woman that was arrested in South Carolina for taking down the flag, the Confederate flag. And so they planned all this out, they met. She didn't know James Tyson, he didn't know her. They taught her how to uh, climb this, this flagpole and take down, the, uh, take, take down the Confederate flag. She went up there, he climbed the fence with her. He wasn't an ally standing on the outside of the fence, he climbed the fence with her. And when the police got there, they decided they were going to tase this fence. And you're talking about electro electrocuting a fence that could have killed her. Now what James did, while he was an ally, he's standing there with her, he's affirming her, and he's saying, okay, I'm going to be a co-conspirator. I'm going to put my life on the line with you. And so what this white man did was he put his hand on that flagpole. <clears throat> the police didn't tase the flagpole. He, he saved her life. So as we look at all of this data and all of this sad stuff, it's real. People's lives are impacted every day just for existing. So we need y'all to put your hands on the flagpole. We need you to take a stand when it comes to transgender and gender expansive people just trying to live their lives. They have the highest rate of homelessness. You have LGBTQ youth whose family reject them just for being who they are. That leads to homelessness. You have people that succumb to intimate partner violence. Crystal Lee Nelson over there. Intimate partner violence. Her husband violently murdered her because of domestic violence. Some of these folks find themselves in situations where they feel like they have to be there in order to survive. You have sex workers. Survival sex. They have no other source of income, right? So this work is near and dear to my heart. It makes me outraged. You know, James Baldwin talks about being in a constant state of rage. It makes me outraged. So I need folks to be out, outraged with me and to take some action. And so um, that's a little bit about this work. I know I, said, I know I said a lot. I hope I didn't depress people. But I, want, I don't want to depress you. I really want to just uh, push you into action when it comes to this work. Um, so the, the other body of work uh, out there really is inspired just about, about my being a black woman in this country. Um, I do a lot of work that's connected to music, that's connected to dance. When I'm painting, my wife will tell you, I probably get on the nerves because I have music going and I'm dancing and I'm doing all these other things. Um, and it, it inspires me to do the work that I do. Uh, so what, what you're going to see outside is you're going to see a 48 by 60 piece of, of John Lewis. That piece took me months. From the research to just the, the time and energy that it took to try to formulate what I wanted that to look like. And if you want to hear a little bit about my process, particularly with the John Lewis and the RBG piece. So um, I, I think I went to the East Metal. I went to a, a lot of different libraries. Just doing research. Just trying to really capture the essence of who they are. Um, and so outside, on, around the, the painted image, you see collages of different magazines or newspaper articles that I researched when I went to uh, the various libraries. And so trying to pull together a story. And I'm not saying I encapsulated all of all the work that John Lewis did. Right? I'm not saying that I did that. What I am saying is that I put my heart, soul, and spirit into the work. And what you see on his face, you see that, you see that bullseye, you see that target. That was intentionally put in that piece. And it was because he laid his life on the line for so many of us in the civil rights struggle. From a, from a student at Morehouse all the way until his last breath, he laid his life, life on the line. And John Lewis was, was, a, a, was a politician that wasn't afraid to stand up for LGBTQ rights before it was a cool thing to do. Mm -hmm. He was fighting for queer people's rights before it was a cool thing to do. That we need folk, more folks to be, uh, to be in that struggle um, uh, with us. 
um, another body of work that, that's near and dear to my heart, and I'll open up the questions in a few minutes, uh, is my, my love series. You see the human body figures out there, and I know it may be a little bit provocative for some folks, but it's okay, it's all right, it's all right. Um, and so that, uh, that series one is inspired by um, the, the female body, the black woman body, right? And um, Malcolm X says that the, uh, the black woman is the, the most disrespected in, in the world, right? And, and, and we know that um, we have experiences that, that other people don't have to endure. And even as, a, as an artist, and I reflect on that, I wanted to highlight the black female body and be unapologetic about what that looks like, about why that is. And so this is about body positivity. This is about owning who we are, not being afraid of the skin that we're in. And so when you see those black bodies uh, out there, those images of those women figures, uh, they're inspired, one, by my love for my wife, who's sitting over there chilling, um, and, and just really saying, um, I am going to uh, be who I am. Um, what that song about Beyonce when you, you know when you pull up your jeans and you, you don't have to do that to pull up your jeans. You know, right. Yeah, you got to pull it up and pull up your jeans. That's okay. It's okay. And so show it, show it the fullness of the female figure, and be it okay with showing the fullness of the female figure. Um, on the vintage luggage, I, I paint on everything. So if I'm not painting on window seals, I'm painting on luggage, I'm painting on chairs. This is up for raffle. So if you want to raffle uh, with this chair, you got to, um, it's part of a raffle. So don't forget to do that. And this will be up to, uh, to, the, to the end of the month. Okay, so we'll wrap it up at the end of the month. Um, so what else? I know I talked about a little, a little, a little tidbit bit of everything. Uh, oh, our clothes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I love you. Wow. <laughs> uh, I, I partnered with uh, this apparel company called uh, Play Out. And it was, they, they, they saw my work that I posted about the Mind Love series on Instagram or somewhere was posted and reached out. It was like, hey, you want to you collaborate? We would love to, you know, have your work on, um, on, our, on our apparel. And it was process that probably took about two years from the beginning of the conversations to actually launching the line of, uh, of apparel. And it's, it's called the Michelle Rivers Collection. It's through pay out, play out apparel, so check it out. I'm wearing it. <laughs> they, sell, uh, they sell pajamas, they sell um, the pajama tops, the pajama pants, the robe, they sell all of that stuff. And what I did was I took pieces of, um, of material from the line and I just put it on some Levi's coveralls. And so you got part of it here, you got it here, on my back, uh, and I just kind of rocked it out and I made some little black you know, lines there to kind of give you a little tuxedo feel look there. <laughs> um, and so again, check it out if you're uh, interested in buying it. It's really, really soft. I'm not, if you want to touch it, it's really soft. It feels good to wear, feels good on the body. Uh, but I'm really proud of the collaboration with Play Out Apparel. Looking to expand to try to get some other collaborations going. It kind of freaks people out again. The whole female body, for some reason, freaks people out. Don't know why, but it does. Uh, but embrace it, love it, uh, absorb the work that you see around you read about what's happening, the epidemic issues that are happening um, in the transgender and gender um, expansive community because we need people to act. We need you to move beyond being allies and to being co-conspirators. I will open it up for questions. <laughs> Who's got questions? Yes. Why don't you go ahead? Well, my your technique. My yeah. techniques. I do it. I always ask my yeah. techniques. Uh, you want me? To, I'll tell you about this particular technique. So, one, um, you will probably, like on some of my older work, I've, you've seen, you will see some work where I've uh, drawn or painted black people as black, right? And and so, as I've evolved, um, I don't I don't paint black people black. 
I just use a different, I just use color. Uh, I'm obsessed with color. Color um, makes me feel good. As you can see, it's color all over me. Um, and so, it, so just to speak on my technique, you will probably never see me do a black person um, in, in black. And I was, as I, someone asked me that recently, and I, and I was trying to think, now that I'm in the, the therapy world, I was trying to think if there was some type of subconscious thing that uh, impacted me and made me kind of move away from that because just as a black person, oftentimes we feel invisible. And so I don't know if that was something that I was countering with how I was feeling about who I am and the invisibility that comes with being a black person in this country. Um, I'm still trying to unpack that and process that, but particularly about this particular piece. So what I do is I, I, I paint the, I draw it out on there and then I paint it. And for this particular piece and that one there, I used uh, lace and I laid lace across it and I went across uh, that with some white uh, molding just to kind of give you that textured feel. If you put your fingers across it, it, it feel, it'll feel a little hard just because it, it, it hardens. And that's what gives you that textured uh, look. But I love texture. Zella in the back is, is textured uh, in that back corner. Um, Zella Viola. And as you move through the Stolen Lives piece, uh, pieces, uh, I was really angry when I started the Stolen Lives Project. So if you look at how the Stolen Lives Project has evolved from that first, that is my first piece in that back corner. And if you look at how, how my pieces have evolved from that back corner to now, I've softened up the work, right? Um, and it subconsciously I realized that the anger that I was feeling when I was first creating the, 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 the images um, has just turned into something different. Um, and it has allowed me to, to, I guess, illustrate what I'm feeling in a, in a softer, in a different way, while I can still highlight and raise awareness for the murders and homicides. I'm just, it's less, less outrage uh, that's flowing through my, flowing through my work. Thank you. Okay. Questions? All these people here, yeah, I know y'all got a question. <laughs> Yes. So can you share with us a little bit about um, how do you pick an object to paint on? So oh, okay. the how and why of how the chair why. Right. That, we're, that you're going to wrap along? Gotcha. Okay. That's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, for me, um, I was, my mom always took us to thrift stores. You know, it's five years, you know, I was moving on all those places. So I'm, I'm used to going to, you know, thrift stores and stuff. And so, um, things have to feel vintage to me. They have to have some type of old feel to them. Mm -hmm. So if I find something that just pops out to me and say, I need it, then it's something I'm going to end up painting on. And so for this particular piece, uh, this particular chair, I needed a high back. So any anytime I'm, I'm going to paint a, a, a chair, something on furniture, it's going to have to have a high back because I, I view the high back as the initial canvas. Because you're not so, this is for, not for sitting, so whoever wins this, do not sit on it. It's hard, do not sit on it. Um, you win it, don't sit on it. Just, just watch it. Just it. Um, and so, you know, the, the, most of the chairs that I get have high backs because I want, I want the back part of it to just pop. And when I start on it, um, typically when I'm starting on it, I don't even know where I'm going to go with it unless I sketch sketch out something first. But with the furniture, I just kind of let it go. I just kind of just let it flow. So I started out initially with just uh, paint and tape. And I'm just painting and taping and pulling the tape and pulling it off and then paint, tape, painting on top of it. And I ended up going back on top of it putting some African masks. But that was that was something I hadn't planned it out at the at the beginning. Um, did I answer your question? Okay. What would you say is the most um, out of the box piece of furniture or item that you painted on? Hmm. Probably a piece that uh, uh, like Frank Abel has in his collection. I was thinking the same. Yeah, thing. yeah. It's a um, it's a coat 
a coat, a, a blazer suit. chair. What is it? Yeah. Suit Where chair? you prepare when men get dressed. Yeah. The shoe jacket, the pants. Yeah, uh, that's the tray on top for cufflinks yeah. and the watch. Uh huh. And this is bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and so with the, with that particular piece uh, that um, uh, Dr. Abel uh, has. I took it apart. Like I took it, I took every piece of it apart. I unscrewed the legs, I unscrewed the back, and I just kind of deconstructed it, right? And then pulled it back together. But again, I didn't know where I was going with it. I didn't know how it was going to end up, and it ended up being like this amazing piece. I donated it to Erase Racism because I, su I support the work that Erase Racism is doing. And uh, Doc Abel ended up uh, winning it at the auction uh, at Erase Racism. Uh, but yeah, that's one of the most out of the box pieces. And what's funny is I've been looking for another one, and I can't, I can't find it. Good. <laughs> My question is about courage. Okay. So um, I think putting your art, you know, out there, you know, you're saying you're creating, but then sharing what you created with others, I think, takes a lot of courage that some people never have. Uh -huh. So one, like, how do you get to that place where you know that what you created is good enough for you mm -hmm. to share? And how do you just find the courage to just put your stuff out there? You know, because I know you've been doing this for years. Yeah. You've been told how many years you've been doing it. And when did you say, I am brave enough, I'm confident enough, I love what I'm doing. Like you said, if no one else loves it, I love it enough. Where did you get that courage? Ooh. Um, I would have to say that, oh, that's, that's hard. Where did I get that courage? Because I think I'm still, I still struggle, you know. Um, I still struggle with wanting people to like my work. Uh, like even being nervous, you know, coming here, I was like, oh my goodness, I, I, I want Sunday to be over. I just want it to be over because, you know. Um, so the courage, I think, was probably just instilled from me, from my, my black mama and my black grandmama. And my grandmother, uh, she called it Diddy, she's one of my biggest fans, even in death. No offense, baby. I know. Um, <laughs> but, you know, my, just, just, just them believing in me, because I, I started drawing in elementary school. I had a teacher in elementary school that, that saw something in me, she, and she would, she would give me stuff to draw, like, all the time. And so, I think just over time, um, me having to not, not only just learn to affirm myself and being okay with, with people not necessarily um, getting my work, but at least I know that it will evoke something from them, whether it's going to evoke you to, to say, oh, I like that color and have a conversation about it, or it could be just a conversation piece where they're uh, exchanging thoughts on what it does bring from them. You know, so I think that that courage has evolved over time. I think I'm to a point where I still am not where I need to be. You know, I'm, I'm still putting my work out there and I'm still showing it. Um, and, I, and again, I'm open for the rejection. And I think it would not crush me as much as it probably would have in the past because I feel like my work is good. Um, whether or not the masses think it's, it's as good as, as I do, I, I think I'm still okay with that. Um, so I still, the, the level of courage where I feel like I need to be, I'm still not there, but I'm getting it. But thank you for that question. Missing black women um, and young women in this country, 
And so I started doing research um, on that, um, and I'm going to start a project uh, on that to, to, to truly, really try to raise awareness on that. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing, um, and I know y'all probably think this information is social justice. It is. It probably, well, most, of, most of the work that I do is, is, is connected to some type of uh, social justice. And so the, uh, the second uh, project that I'm going to uh, be working on um, is connected to uh, the whitewashing of, of, of music and how uh, black artists from you know years ago would uh, produce these songs, put these songs out, and white artists would then uh, you know, use their songs and they would get all the popularity, make all the music and all of those things. And some of these people died poor. You know, um, and so the the concept that that I'm going to be really um, fighting with is um, navigating how I want to portray it because I'm planning to use um, uh, old album covers and going over those album covers to. No, seriously, I'm going over. I'm painting over the the white album covers um, and to to highlight those black artists uh, whose work. Um, whose work was used and they, they didn't profit from it. Um, and so, yeah, so those are two things that, you know, that I'm going to be working on. Thank you for that question. Got to put it out there. Yeah. And, and, to, and, to, and, to my, and to my white brothers and sisters, you know, talking about, you know, race and all of those things, I know sometimes some of us may be a little bit uncomfortable talking about it, but it's okay. Sit in the discomfort. Just sit in discomfort because it's, a, it's, the, it's the reality of, of, of our country and, and what I see about us in this room that we are all in here unified together. And what we have to stop doing is allowing other stuff to divide us. Right? We're, all in, we're all in this uh, together. Somebody had a question? Yeah. Do you, have, uh, hi. Do you have any work that you saved when you were a child? Any artwork of yours? From elementary to middle school? Oh, okay. <laughs> No, because that would have been my mom's responsibility. <laughs> no, I do not. But I do have some pieces uh, upstairs in the glass case from like 2004 or 2006 or something like that, like old work that I just wanted to bring. Um, so kind of people can kind of see the evolution of, of, of me, which is just outrageous in and of itself. Uh, so check it out if you get a chance to, to go upstairs. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, you talked about dancing and yes. listening to music while you uh, make your yes. art, and I wanted to know: Does the music ever inspire the piece wholly, or is it just a way to keep your like creativity flowing? Like, has the has a song been the one thing that made the piece come alive, or was it? No, it's just I think I think I use it as a, as a backdrop to kind of keep me there, to kind of keep me. Um, in the moment to kind of keep me in that flow. Um, a lot of us experience flow, but you don't even realize you're experiencing flow. And flow is a thing, you know. Uh, so when 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 you're doing something and you just can't stop, like I was telling him the other night, I was like, I can paint all night, but I gotta go to work. <laughs> Chris would be mad if I don't show up for work. Uh, and so you know, from paint from wanting to to be in that flow and painting all night, um, you know that that fuels the work uh, that. I do because I'm so passionate about creating uh, and I'm so passionate about putting what I'm feeling and all that emotion just putting it on canvas uh, so that you all can kind of take it in. Yes? It's a follow up question okay. to it. Then what music do you listen to? Like oh. an artist or something? <laughs> so like a variety. So from uh, old school R&B uh, to, to reggae. Uh, uh, Marvin Gaye, I, I'm, I could sing Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell like all of this night. Um, but yeah, so th that 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 type of stuff. Quincy Jones. Yeah, Whitney Houston. Oh yeah. 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 I have one other question. How? Oh, uh, so hold on. Oh, sorry. Yes. I thought you had a question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So you mentioned that you're part of the uh, mental health professionals. Yes. How, if, have you used any of your art in the mental health field? Or have you planned to your art towards working with that? Yeah, so I, I, um, clients. Yeah, so I, I work as a, I work part time as an art therapist. And so I use my, my, uh, my art 
not my art, but the art that the, the client is creating, uh, just as a, I guess as a road map, really, to get them to unpack what they're experiencing uh, in their subconscious. It really uh, allows them an opportunity <coughs> to use visual imagery to express what they're feeling, uh, whether it's a person that's dealing with gender identity issues or whether it's a person that has post-traumatic stress disorder or whether it's a person that has racialized trauma. Um, so the, what we what we do is we provide them with an art experiential or an art directive. And what I mean by that is that um, I could say to a person, uh, draw me a house, tree, and a person. Okay, and how they draw that house in proximity to the tree, in proximity to the person, is going to tell me a lot. The size of the house is going to tell me something. Whether or not their branches on the trees are going to tell me something. What the person is doing, where the person is in proximity to the house, those things tell me a lot about who that is that's drawing that person. They don't realize it's telling me that, but the, the work that you put on the paper tells me a lot. Thank you. That's deep. Well, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. How you doing? That's just fine. How are you? Is there any, might be a weird question, but is there any degree to which you become aware of some of the things that maybe were in your own mind later after you put these parts together? Yeah, and absolutely. Because, because once, 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 uh, once they finish it, you process, I process it with the client. Or are you some other person? For you, oh, for uh, me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, that, yeah. so that's the thing. Um, that's what I was saying about this whole Stolen Lives project. I realize now understanding that part of the subconscious and how that is really manifested in the work. When I started the Stolen Lives project, I was pretty pissed. You know, and that rage that I was feeling about the epidemic proportions of transgender and gender nonconforming and gender expansive people being murdered in this country and nobody was like Nobody was saying anything. And so um, that caused that heavy pressure that you see back there. You see how heavy that pressure is back right there, that back corner, and all those pieces there? That is what I was feeling. And so and that's what manifested in that work. And so now that I understand that, right, I can analyze myself and say, I know I was angry as hell on that. <laughs> right? And so, uh, and so it, it just changes. It, it, it allows you, once you understand how your subconscious comes to the forefront visually, um, it has allowed me to really unpack and reflect on a lot of my work. Yeah. So thank you for that. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> it, it was like, <laughs> how do you decide the size? Because that would be a uh, Peter Ginsburg. Uh -huh. That's a large campus. Yeah. And how do you decide, well, how do you make that decision yeah. when you're um, about to paint? Yeah, so I, I knew I wanted uh, John, I, I did John first. Yeah, John. So I knew John, I, I knew I wanted it to, to be a, a statement piece. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the, the larger the piece, um, you know, the, the more that I could really capture in terms of the history, in terms of really, um, getting to the essence of who he was as a, as a person and so that's that's why I chose that for that particular piece um, and same for for Ruth the Bader Ginsburg I wanted I wanted Ruth to, to be portrayed if you if you stand back from Ruth's picture I wanted I wanted to convey almost like a superhero effect you know with the with how I did the um, the geometric patterns on the side I wanted to have kind of have a, a superhero feel uh, just because she just was a champion for so many, um, for so long. Um, and so deciding on, on those two particular pieces was the reason why I went that large. And cost is also an issue. Like the bigger pieces, the bigger pieces, the, the canvas cost more. Right? And I was okay um, with, you know, spending money on, on those pieces. It, it, I had to, like, do research. Um, go and print out stuff at the library, save it and try to print it out somewhere else and then go to buy stuff so I can deposit it, put the, uh, the ceiling and the glue and all of that stuff. Uh, this stuff is, 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 is costly. Plug, buy something. Um, <laughs>
telling you. Questions? Any other questions? Ebony, my fellow artist brother back there. <laughs> Hi, um, not, a, not, a, um, not a question, yeah. but um, more like a commentary. I'm really, I'm really, really impressed with your work. Um, the time we met up until now, and you have continued to be an inspiration to so many young artists that are coming up. Um, how you have challenged us to step out of the fear zone, the fear of rejection, mm -hmm. and how people are going to view your work and being able to talk to a racially diversified group and let them know it's okay mm -hmm. to have that race conversation because you said it was the country we live in, but from somebody who lived in West Africa, it's the world we live in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So until we begin to, and our art is the icebreaker to this conversation. Yeah. So I just wanna say thank you for everything you've done. You've impacted us way more than you could ever think or imagine. And I just want to thank you. Thank you. There have been no other questions. Feel free to walk around. There's food out there. I'll, I'll, I'll stay for a second and answer any questions if anybody has any other questions. Appreciate y'all for coming.